Ah, summer. <laughs> During my teenage years, if there were two songs which captured my thoughts and my attitudes about what summer was all about, it was those two songs. On the one hand, it's all about peace and quiet, like a pristine sunrise. And on the other hand, it's no more classes, no more books, no more teachers' dirty looks. Yeah. Ah, so this, this captures my adolescent attitude that summer. It was a, it was a time to just check out. Uh, even if I, I, just, I always tried my best to even just disappear if I could. Uh, one of my favorite things in life, this it drives me nuts as a parent now when I see my kids doing the same thing, but when I was a kid, my favorite thing to do was to disappear into my dad's office and play video games for hours on end on, on, our, on our Apple II Plus computer. <laughs> um, I, haven't vol- I haven't fully grown up yet, at least that's what Becky tells me, but as I continue to grow up, I am discovering that this checking out attitude is antithetical to pursuing life to the full as I'm becoming to understand it as a Christian. This abundant life that Jesus shares with us, this full life that he gives to us freely, it's not about disappearing, is it? It's actually, in some ways, it's quite the opposite. So it's not about checking out. On the other hand, the full life is not this unrelenting, monotonous grind, putting out this high level of effort day after day, like a never-ending checklist of spiritual chores to do either, is it? Have you ever heard the saying, the devil never takes a vacation, does he? Of course, this implies that we should always be hard at work serving God in a never-ending battle with darkness, right? However, the logic of this statement leaves me wondering, why in the world would I imitate the devil in anything, in any way, shape, or form? Wouldn't I rather want to imitate Jesus, my, my Lord, my, my Savior? So, if summer's not about checking out, and neither is it about checking off a bunch of things on a list, what is involved in living life to the full And as we come into summer, what does that look like? What unique opportunities are there in the summer to imitate Jesus? What does the full life look like? So that's what we want to talk about for the next three messages, how to have a great summer. There's no denying that summertime is different, right? The weather changes ever so briefly, and then we get this again. Our schedules change. Often we go and we travel. Uh, we eat differently. I love the increase in grilled food that I, uh, I get in my diet in the summer. Our whole pace of life changes. It's altered. So today and, and for the next two weeks, we want to examine what unique opportunities there are to imitate Jesus during this amazing season that we get every, every year, usually. Um, so next week... Jason Kaliba is going to look specifically at the out corner of the, of the relationship triangle. If you've been hanging out with us over, since fall, we've been talking a lot about the triangle as kind of a little image of the three different priorities, that, uh, kinds of relationships that Jesus prioritized. Those out relationships are those relationships that we have with people who don't know God, who don't know Christ, and it's an uh, opportunity to reach out to them and share God's love and his gospel with them. That's where Jason's going to go next week. And the following week after that, our other distinguished Jason, Jason Dimnick, is going to help us see some of the unique opportunities that the summer gives us to pursue spirituality. And so summer can be a wonderful time of, of focusing on God, on that upward relationship that we have with the Father, and, um, and just the nature itself seems to be inspirational during the, the summer time of year on, on connecting with God. And so to get us started today, you might expect me to be talking about something along the lines of the in corner of the triangle, but I like to be difficult or different, and so... I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to go that way today. 
But instead, I want us to turn our attention to the uh, work rest uh, rhythms that we have in our life. We all go through times of productivity, preparation, growing, then harvest, creation, recreation, abiding, fruitfulness. And rather than just focusing on in, our relationship with each other, brothers and sisters in the family of God, when we focus on our work rest rhythms, we can see the potential for how God can use those rhythms to impact all three corners of the triangle and, and, uh, and really enrich and bless us there. So to get us going in that direction, how to have a good summer by being more mindful of our work-rest rhythms, I want to root our thoughts this morning in a, uh, in a famous passage of Scripture found in John chapter 15. If you brought your Bibles, I'd encourage you to turn there. And... Jesus gives us this really powerful metaphor about what life uh, is like and how, it, how, how, to, how to pursue life to the full, really, in, in, a, in a really beautiful word picture. So I'm going to read the first 17 verses here of John chapter 15. I'm the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he produces the branches, and he, sorry, that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they will produce even more. You've already been pruned and purified by the message I've given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. For those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Some branches are, are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it'll be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I've told you these things so that you may be filled with joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There's no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. If you're my friends, you are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends since I have told you everything the fathers told me. You didn't choose me. I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask using my name. This is my command. Love one another. So to give us a framework for how our work-rest relationships can naturally fit in our lives, I want to make three quick observations about, about fruitfulness from this passage. The first observation is that fruitfulness is a natural byproduct of abiding in Jesus. This passage makes that abundantly clear. The father, the gardener, uh, cuts off every branch that doesn't produce fruit. He He prunes branches that do bear fruit so that they'll produce even more. Later on in verse eight, when you produce much fruit, you're my true disciples. This brings great glory to my father. And verse 16, I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit. This is a lovely picture, being connected to Jesus and the Father tending to us as branches to encourage us to spur on more fruitfulness. The downside is that we don't live in a world that encourages and nurtures us in that way, does it? We live in a driven culture, a success-oriented culture. 
And that driven success orientation turns this perspective of fruitfulness being a byproduct of our life into maybe a set of expectations. I don't know about you, but I feel pressure to perform, to prove my fruitfulness. We live in such a performance-driven culture. I I think this pressure to perform is like a, a, a tractor beam. Does anybody know what a tractor beam is? All you sci-fi nerds out there, you know what I'm talking about. There is another pastor in this church who makes frequent references to a certain movie that shall not be named today. But in these sci-fi adventures, quite often, a spaceship will get sucked into a tractor beam by a bigger, more evil, nefarious uh, spaceship, and you have no power. That force is so strong pulling on that poor guy that... No matter how hard you try to pull away, that tractor beam pulls you in. Our society's drive for success is so strong that even though fruitful life that God wants to give us is there, it's all we got to do is abide in Jesus. Our culture warps our perspective and we get sucked into this pressure to just do more, work harder, strive more, put in more hours, and maybe we'll get successful at what we're trying to do. But when we get sucked into that tractor beam, we're missing out. And hard as we try to please God and to live a good life, we don't experience life to the full, do we? Ironically, this is very ironic because the second observation I wanted to give you about this passage is that this full and fruitful life is supposed to be a joyful and powerful thing. Jesus said in verses 10 and 11, When you obey my commands, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you'll be filled with joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. In verse 7, he says, ask for, it's powerful. Ask for anything you want and it'll be granted. The Father will give you whatever you ask for when you ask in my name. The full life is a thing of joy. It's a thing of power and strength. And yet, the tractor beam pulls me back. Questions still loom. What if I'm not feeling this joy? What if I don't experience this power? Am I doing as enough as a disciple? What if I get it wrong? What if my kids don't turn out? What if I'm wasting my time? These are hard questions. And often, to answer them, we're faced with making hard choices. Our priorities often get challenged. I think in a very tangible, practical way, it's when we wrestle with these things that we're experiencing the Father's pruning hook, these tough choices, cutting something away from our life. It's not fun. I understand the need for pruning in my life, but it's painful when when it happens, and it makes me wonder, did I really sign up for this? The fruitful life is joyful and powerful, but it's not easy. Third observation I wanted to to give you is that this fruitful life, it's impossible to experience it if we're detached from Jesus. He says in verse 5, those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. I've loved you even as the Father has loved me. Now remain in my love. You didn't choose me. I chose you. I appointed you. What a great invitation to know that God is actively seeking out and and appointing us, choosing us. That tractor beam, though, it, it interferes with this as well anxieties, the pressure to perform even for God pushes me to ask, what do I have to do to maintain this connection? How do I really know if I'm remaining in God, remaining in Jesus? If we let this tractor beam anxiety become the underlying focus, this abiding in Christ that we're supposed to be experiencing, 
it never really happens. Instead, it, it gets warped into some kind of never-ending list of duties. We're stuck in that tractor beam. And, and the harder we work, the more we struggle, all we end up doing is expending more energy and burning ourselves out. Even Peter, if you read back a couple of chapters in John 13, even Peter, Jesus' trusted disciple, he promised he would even go so far as to die for Jesus. And yet, only a few days later, Peter denied Jesus three times. In our heads, we know that we can't overpromise and underdeliver to God. We need his help. And yet, how many of us, like Peter, oversell our intentions and then eventually flame out in a blaze of anything but glory? So we're stuck with this dilemma. All of these anxieties to perform, this, this irresistible pull of the tractor beam to, to be, try to be successful, it's very real. There is the expectation that God wants us to bear fruit. On that pathway to joy, we can expect pruning, but joy, joyful life doesn't equal an easy life. And how do I know I'm doing this whole abiding in Jesus thing right in the first place? When we live this way, when we stay stuck on those anxieties, we miss out. We miss out and we miss the fact that Jesus invites us into a fruitful relationship of love and joy that fits naturally into our lives. It's not about checking off duties and, and managing our anxieties. Jesus gets this. He gets this and he shows it in this passage that he shares with his disciples. Everything I think turns on the verse that I'm gonna share with you right now. Actually, I'm not gonna read it from you because it's stuck in my head. He talks about how there's no greater love that a person can have than to lay one's life down on the line for his friends. And then he says to his disciples, I no longer call you servants. I don't call you slaves. But instead, you're my friends. I no longer call you servants, but I call you my friend. I wonder, for those of us who are, feel like they're stuck in the tractor beam, I wonder how many of us really have embraced this idea that we can be friends with Jesus, that Jesus actually embraces us, that he wants to just share with us the things that, that, that the Father has made known to him. Maybe, and I just, I just feel like maybe we just need to stop right now. Just ex- take, take a minute to just examine your own heart and your own life and ask yourself, am I really friends with Jesus? It may be a question that you've only thought about just now because I'm asking it, and this is the first time you've considered that. Or maybe you've been on this road with Jesus for so long and it's become so much of a routine and so much uh, a part of your, your, your habits and, your, and that it just, you've lost sight of the fact that, that at the heart of it is friendship, this love relationship with Jesus. If, this, if you want to get off of the treadmill, if you, want to, if you want to break free of the tractor beam, I just, I, I feel like I need to just stop and, and, and I invite you to just pray with me for a second, okay? So I'm going to say a prayer and in your hearts, you can just affirm this in your, if, in your own life for yourself right now. Lord God, I'm just, I'm stuck and I'm trying to do things and I'm not getting where I need to go with you and with my own life. And I, as hard as I try, it's not working. And Lord Jesus, I need you as my friend in my life. Maybe for the first time, or maybe it's again. And so Lord God, I open myself up to you, and I ask you to remove all the things that's holding me back. I ask you to fill me with your spirit and help me to walk with you like a friend. Amen. So, 
if, you've, if, that's, if that's where your heart is, if you really resonate with what, what we were just praying about there, I'd encourage you to talk about it with a spiritual friend of yours, someone who's close to you. You could talk with the person sitting beside you after the service. You can come and talk to one of the pastors here. But I encourage you not to let the day go by without expressing to somebody this transaction that you're making with Jesus, okay? So, if we want to be, if we're friends with Jesus, we are faced with a decision. If we really stop to listen to these words from Jesus, I think we're going to discover that we have a choice. We can either continue to struggle with our spiritual anxieties and keep trying to work things out on our own, like a servant. You know how a servant never really knows where he or she stands with the master? We can choose to live that way, never really knowing where we stand, or we can let go of the anxiety, we can let go of the pressure to succeed, and we can just simply embrace Jesus as a friend. And if we are able to break free from this tractor beam of spiritual performance anxiety, well, then what? What what next? What does a friendship with Jesus look like? There was a a commentator that I read when I was studying for this this sermon who makes a really interesting statement. His name's Gary Burge, and he writes that John 15 emphasizes that neither doctrine, our way of thinking, nor our ethics, our way of living, can alone define Christian discipleship. It reminds us that remaining in Christ, having an interior experience of Jesus as a branch that is nourished and strengthened by a vine, this kind of experience is a non-negotiable feature of following Jesus. Without a transforming spirituality that creates supernatural life, doctrine and ethics lose their value. What we need is that spirituality that creates a supernatural life. So let's reflect on Jesus' vine metaphor here for a minute. In the life of a vine, there is a certain rhythm implied. Vines rest and then they bear fruit. Vines are pruned, and then there's harvesting. And year after year, these cycles repeat themselves. Now, as our friend, Jesus has already put his life on the line for us. We don't have to redo that part. Jesus already chosen us to love us with the exact same love that he receives from the Father. And if we're pursuing a fruitful rhythm for life, we discover that we have permission to enter into these rhythms. We have permission to stop. We have permission to get going and really be fruitful at times. To abide in Christ along the way in all of these things, whether it's stopping or working. Jesus is telling us with this metaphor that the fruitful life, pursuing the full life, is something that's organic. It's it's not forced. A grapevine doesn't spend its summer going, oh, I got to make more grapes, I got to make more grapes. It's ludicrous to think, think of it that way, right? It's organic. It's unforced. It doesn't exert much effort squeezing out those grapes. Life to the full is organic. So the connected friend of Jesus has nothing to fear. Any anxious servant doesn't really know where he or she stands. So I want to share with you some of the organic rhythms that I see that are built into our life uh, with you. Now, I get some of these ideas from uh, a guy named Mike Breen and the, the, his, his compadres at Three Dimensional Ministries. And when we have a, a, a pretty reliable grip on what these work-rest rhythms are about, they can point us towards how we can rest properly, and how we can stay fruitful and abiding in Christ for a long, long time without burning out. And in the words of of Burge, it helps us develop that transforming spirituality that creates supernatural life. So firstly, I want to talk about daily rhythms. 
Now, an interesting thing about our daily rhythms is, is every day we have opportunities to be silent. Uh, I see it in two ways, these opportunities come. One is with scripture and with prayer. Jesus took time on many occasions uh, to, to just retreat and pray and, and be alone with, with the Father. In fact, he, had, he was so much in the habit of that, the crowds that would follow him around caught on to it, and they'd actually follow him in into his quiet times and actually disrupt those times as well. And it, it's funny, this, if you take a quick read through the Gospels, in some ways, Jesus spends mo- much of his time trying to get away from the crowds because this was so important to him. Daily time with God in the word and in prayer is important. Now, I gotta tell you, it's not gonna yield earth-shattering, life-altering results every day. At least, it hasn't for me. But what it does do is it puts me in a place where I can hear God on a regular basis. I'm more ready to hear his voice if I'm in that regular habit. Our regular prayer rhythms may not may not give us some sort of, you know, life-changing vision for life every time we do it, but it cultivates an environment for transformation to happen when the time is right. The other daily rhythm or daily opportunity for silence is quite simply sleeping. I think that God's given us sleep to remind us that we are not indispensable. We can go to sleep, and the world will carry on just fine without us. The sun doesn't need its, our help for it to rise every morning. And getting a good rest can clue us in to what God is doing and that he's taking care of things and it doesn't depend on me. So those are daily rhythms. What about weekly rhythms? There's this old Hebrew word called Sabbath and quite literally it means to stop. And I'd like to share with you two reasons to stop, rest and recreation. Jesus was in the habit of of worshiping at the synagogues on a weekly basis. And he also took time to rest and relax with his friends. The house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus was in a little suburb outside of Jerusalem called Bethany. And this house was one of his favorite stopping points on on his many journeys to and fro from, from Jerusalem. He liked to take time to fellowship with friends. So rest is not just stopping for the sake of stopping. Jesus has a better point for rest than that. Resting is a time for abiding. Life-giving rest is a chance to experience and receive the resources for the work that needs to be done in order to be fruitful on on the jobs that God has given us to do. And recreation in this context for this kind of abiding is an opportunity to explore and embrace all these things that God's given us in the world around us. Yeah, it includes weekly worship activities, but it can also encompass hobbies and interests. And it, all of these things can be a way of embracing all the goodness that this world that God has made for us that it has to offer. And we can embrace it all as a gift from God. Weekly rhythms are an opportunity to do that. Monthly rhythms maybe lend themselves more to times of solitude. Reflection and meditation, uh, more prayer. Uh, From time to time, Jesus would invite his disciples into his quiet times. And when I I reflect on it, I, I just think, what a... What a sweet thing it is to hear Jesus say to me, come away with me to a quiet place. We don't have time every day to dive deep into God's word or to spend concentrated times in prayer. If we carve out time on maybe a monthly basis or somewhere in that time frame to to go somewhere quiet, maybe with a good friend or a mentor or even on your own in solitude, it's a very life-giving pursuit to just take some time and go to a quiet place with God. And this is a rhythm that I would encourage everybody to explore. You can do it on your own or with a mentor or a spiritual companion, the friends that you have in your two to four groups or in in your life groups. I know that there are many of you that are already making this a priority 
and, and you're enjoying it and, and benefiting from it. And I, for one, feel very lucky that I get to do this with my coworkers here at the church on a regular basis. It's a life-giving thing to do. The fourth set of rhythms are the seasonal rhythms. And because preachers like to have everything in a nice uh, alliteration, we'll call this sabbatical stuff. Uh, Jesus th- went through many seasons in his life. He grew up in a small village. He had a time where he learned his father's trade as a carpenter. Just before his public ministry, he went through a season where he went into the wilderness and fasted for 40 days. There were seasons that Jesus experienced in life. And we all go through different seasons ourselves. We move from one thing to the next, and they fit together in like, into a chain of our development. All these seasons make some sort of contribution to who we are and, and, and what our relationships are like with God, with other people, our families, our friends, our church. And some of these seasons can be long and gradual, but sometimes they can be short and intense. Sometimes these seasons just happen to us. You take a look at the four seasons, whether we get them or not and in the right order, that's, that's something we have no control over. They just happen to us. Uh, circumstances are beyond our control, but they can shape our lives, don't they? There are other times, though, where we take a season to intentionally focus on something. Maybe it's to actually take a sabbatical and, and study an area that we want to grow in and learn in. Um, maybe it's just taking a time in our life to pause and reflect on a major life transition, or maybe we have a big decision ahead of us. These are seasons. So the important thing to remember with all of these rest rhythms is, is that they're woven into our regular ongoing lives. It's woven into our work. It's woven into our stopping. These are not things to add to your to-do lists. They are natural rhythms. Remember, the fruitful life is organic and it can't be forced. They're already built into our life. It just takes awareness to be able to leverage them so that we can be found abiding in Jesus. They can actually, they, they, they naturally help us to take time to abide in the vine. And they help us cultivate um, in our own lives opportunities to encounter the life-giving things that Jesus is talking about in this passage. Yeah, just, just review quickly some of the things that, that are taking place when this abiding has happened that Jesus talks about. Verse seven, 7, Jesus says that the word abides in you. Our up relationship is nurtured. In 7 and 16, he talks about our prayers being heard and answered in a powerful way. This has an impact on, on our relationships, the people that we pray for, both in the side of the church family and the, the people that we do business with in life. All of these relationships can be impacted greatly as we, as we pray and see God answer those prayers. Uh, verses 9 through 13 talks about love for God, love for other disciples. Um, these, these are things that God wants to nurture and grow in our life. Talks about in verse 11 about experiencing great joy. In verse 15, talks about how I don't call you a servant because a servant doesn't know what his master is up to, but I'm calling you friends because I've told you everything that the Father's told me. We get to actually get in on God's plan, get in on what he's doing in the world. These are the, these are the results of a, of a life that's cultivating these rhythms of work and rest and, and weaving them into the, the natural comings and goings of our life. And as we learn to rest in these rhythms, our anxieties over spiritual performance, they start to lose their relevance and our work lives become more fruitful and rewarding. So let's try to wrap this up with an observation and a challenge. If you go all the way back to the first story of creation in Genesis chapters one through three, you'll notice that the, the heavens and the earth, God created them uh, in, 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 what was it, six days. And on the seventh day, he rested. When did humanity enter into the picture? 
It was on the sixth day, right? So the observation is, is that our first full day of existence was the Sabbath. And everything else after that, all the work that he had for us to do in the garden, taking care of it, having dominion over it, all of that stuff came from the day of rest. Is it possible that we've got it backwards, that rest isn't there for us to rest from our work? Maybe it's the other way around. Maybe God's natural design is for us to work from our rest. So here's the challenge. We're entering into summer, right? School is out for some of us already, and it's going to be a great time, regardless of the weather. So I think this is an opportunity for us to stop and prepare for the fall. It's typically summers when we rest more than, we, more than normal, and fall is typically when that whole thing starts back up again. I would like to challenge you to really be intentional and use this summer to prepare for the fall. So the way that challenge is going to look is I would like you to think about one of the first three rhythms that I shared with you, the daily, the weekly, the monthly, and I want you to prayerfully consider what you want to try to do differently in terms of rhythms. Maybe you want to start in the daily habit of scripture, or maybe the summer is a time for you to start getting better sleep instead of just burning the candle at both ends. Then again, Maybe the challenge will be, will be for you to set up a weekly pattern of rest and recreation, a regular pattern of worship or fellowshipping with friends, or maybe it's taking up a hobby with a loved one or a friend. Then again, maybe you want to take on the challenge of weaving in a, a, a monthly rhythm in, carving out time for solitude. We have, in our backyard, just 30 miles from here, one of the most amazing retreat centers called Kingsfold. It is, hands down, one of the most beautiful places on earth to visit. If you've never been before, I, I encourage you, make the drive and check it out and just spend some time uh, in God's presence, resting and reflecting. So in a moment, we're gonna have a time of prayer and I'm gonna encourage you to just reflect on what are those extra, what are the, what are the next steps that you want to take in terms of weaving in some of these natural rhythms that God's built into our life in order to be able to abide in Christ more. And as we do that, and as we pray towards that, I'm praying that we will experience true friendship with Jesus as we learn to abide in him. Let's pray. Lord God, you know each one of us. You know where our hearts are. And you know, you know what we need. That's how well you know us. And Lord, I pray that as we just take this moment to pause and reflect on, on what, what our life can look like, I pray that for all of us that we could really capitalize on these summer months ahead that as we rest, as we enjoy the, 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 the warm season of the year, that we could rest in your warmth. And beyond that, Lord, I pray that as each and every one of us thinks about some of the changes that the pruning and the, the, the alterations that we want to make to our, our habits, I pray that... Uh, you would help us to keep our friendship with your son Jesus in a focus and that by your spirit we would be ready and able for a fruitful and exciting and joy-filled fall ahead. And we pray this in your name. Amen.